Good morning. I'm Ben Ayers, Dean of the Terry College of Business, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Terry Exec Ed Center, as well as our Terry Through Thursday program. This is the home of our executive MBA program, our professional MBA program, our newly launched uh, online MBA program. We'll have our first class starting in September, uh, as well as the home of our executive programs where we offer open enrollment and custom programs for leading companies in Atlanta and across the Southeast and beyond. Uh, I want to thank the alumni board for organizing today's event and this entire series, as well as our corporate sponsor, Synovus, and then our media sponsor, WABE. So please join me in thanking all of them. So coming up next month, we've got George uh, McCarrow, who's the CEO of Ted's Montana Grill, and then in April, we'll have Jenna Drosis, who's the CEO of Signet Jewelers. Um, I have missed on in January, I've been spreading mediocre economic news across the state uh, with, with gust. Uh, so uh, it was great for us to be able to go through that. We started that in December and wrapped up last week in Jekyll Island. And uh, our hope is that the economy performs better than our predictions, but it was a great series. Uh, that is the Terry College's largest public service and outreach um, event that we do each year. And it was great to go and connect across the state. And my hope is that next year, I'll actually get to, to provide a more positive forecast. Uh, this morning's talk will be a fireside chat, hence we've set it up like this. Uh, and that's going to be facilitated by Nancy Watley. We all know Nancy. She was the Mer Meritus Chair of uh, the Alumni Board and also was previous chair of the Terry Through Thursday Committee, if I remember correctly. And today's speaker is Ryan Turner. Ryan and his partners created Unsucka. Did I get that correct? Unsucka. Unsucka. Unsuck okay. Uh, which consists of four restaurant concepts. Ryan has devoted his career to building a network of restaurants that both celebrate food and community while supporting the men and women who make that food and sense of community possible. Over the past two decades, he's launched some of the most exciting eateries in the Atlanta food scene, from Deli Muss and Turner's in 2005 to Restaurant and Bourbon Bar Local 3 to his new modern diner, Rochambeau. His company, Unsuck A Restaurants, was recognized as the Georgia Restaurants Association's Restaurateurs of the Year Award in 2011. Ryan was named the Business Person of the Year by the Metro Atlanta Chamber, as well as Atlanta Business Chronicle in 2014. However, he may be best known for helping to establish the Giving Kitchen, which is a nonprofit that provides emergency financial assistance to people in the food service industry when they miss work for medical reasons. Ryan was a founding member and board chair of the Giving Kitchen, and he currently serves on the board. In 2015, Unsuck A was Restaurants was awarded the National Restaurant Association's highest honor, the Cornerstone Humanitarian Award in recognition of the role in founding Giving Kitchen. In 2019, Giving Kitchen was named the James Beard Foundation Humanitarian of the Year. Ryan is originally from Maine. He graduated from the University of Vermont in 1994. Married a Georgia Bulldog, correct? <laughs> Terry College grad, awesome. Uh, he served in AmeriCorps in Arizona along the border of Mexico, and he moved to Atlanta in 1995 as the food and beverage manager for East Lake Golf Club, which we all love. Please join me in welcoming Nancy Watley and Ryan Turner. Good morning. Uh, thank you very, very much for having me. This is a, an honor on, on many levels. Um, as uh, Bill said, I, I married a Georgia Bulldog. I was very fortunate when I first moved to Atlanta to meet Shelly. Uh, she is a Terry College alum as well. Um, I've, I've had the uh, privilege of, of speaking in front of a lot of groups, and none has had more street cred for her than this group, <laughs> which is pretty cool. Um, it's also, uh, you know, as a, uh, a liberal arts grad and uh, a restaurant owner, I'm trying to figure out why you all want to hear what I have to say. <laughs> um, but I can tell you how not to do restaurants, at least, and uh, which you probably already learned in school. 
Uh, so it's, it's an honor to be here. Um, I, uh, I hope uh, you at least give me an opening bit of trust that maybe I have something that might be worthy of your consideration. Um, and uh, I think we're going to have a Q&A session. And I, I prefer these um, scenarios where uh, if you do have questions, I'd rather talk to things that you guys think are relevant versus just shouting at you what I think is relevant. So if you have some questions, I'm open to them. Um, so let's go. Let's go. So the first thing you have to tell us is um, how did you come up with the name? Yeah, got it. <laughs> and tell us what it means. Yeah, I will. Uh, so when we first uh, went to go open Muss and Turner's, uh, a friend of ours who is a chef uh, used to have a, a term that um, was uh, not so endearing in uh, mocking the French and especially French chefs. And this guy was a chef, and he would call something unsoqué. Uh, and uh, which at the time we thought was pretty funny. I wanted to call our restaurant that, and thank God everyone talked me out of it. Uh, we ended up with Muss and Turner's. Todd Mussman's my original partner. Uh, Mussman and Turner sound like a law firm, so we went with Muss, which is his nickname. And um, so when we went, and when Chris Hall joined our mix, uh, when we were going to open Local 3, uh, we decided to create a holding company and that was my chance to have the Unsuke name because at that time I did not think it would be a, uh, a, a forward-facing brand name. Uh, and it turns out that the, the name catches once, no one can pronounce it, but once you hear it and understand it's a, it's a completely fabricated word that sounds French for doesn't suck, um, <laughs> which is kind of a guiding principle of ours, uh, then you don't forget it. And uh, so it's kind of it's kind of stuck at this point. So, so that's a good thing. So how? Let's go back. Tell us how you got to Atlanta, and what were you doing when you first got here before yeah. you went into this whole restaurant conglomerate? Yeah. So, I um, I spent uh, right after I graduated, I spent a, a year of uh, service with AmeriCorps along the border of Mexico, uh, living in Arizona, which was an incredibly enlightening experience. But um, when that was done, um, I had a, a guy who I was living with who had a connection with his friend's dad was the director of ops for the Atlanta Committee for the Olympic Games. And so this is in 90, 95. And uh, I said, well, you know, I'm going to migrate back towards Maine. And Atlanta sounds pretty cool. And this is exciting. I, at that time, I could speak Spanish fluently. And um, so I got there and, and got an interview. And I was told very graciously, um, we really don't need you until the Olympics start, uh, and uh, you can help people find the bathroom that can't speak English, and you can use your Spanish then. And I said, well, that's, that's great. That's not going to work. So I started, uh, I had to pay the bills and uh, started working at a restaurant I think is still open called Villa Cristina mm -hmm. on the perimeter. I was a busboy there for two days. Um, <laughs> and, um, and You did got, well. Yeah. Uh, Post-shift, got recruited by uh, a corporate training team for Rio Bravo, if anyone remembers. Um, one of my, my first night in Atlanta was at Rio Bravo and Buckhead on a Thursday night, and anyone who remembers that. Um, and coming, coming from the Don't desert, make us tell. living in the desert for a year, and coming to that, I was like, oh my god. Um, and uh, I, I made a decision I was going to stick around Atlanta for a little bit. And um, so anyway, started working in the restaurant business and ended up uh, getting a job with the uh, Industrial Bank of Japan uh, in their Atlanta agency in the 191 Tower, which sounded great. And my parents were proud and the resume looked good. But I was in a business, you know, I was entry level. I was wearing, you know, I had enough money for cheap suits and I was living in East Cobb, so I couldn't afford to park. So I had to take Cobb County Transit both ways, um, which was really beneficial because um, I was actively social, so I could sleep. Um, but at the same time, I could also, um, you know, read or, or listen to listen to books on tape or things like that. So it was a, it was a, an interesting time. But anyway, um, ended up working at uh, the food studio with Todd Mossman in the late '90s, and uh, soon after that, uh, ended up becoming the food and beverage manager at East Lake Golf Club, uh, which I was there for four years, and that was before we opened Muss and Turner. So. And that is unsuke. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was cool. Yeah, yeah, I bet. So tell us, tell us about the restaurants. Um, and you absolutely have to tell us about the freezer door. Sure. Yeah. So Muss and Turner's. And, and by the way, if anyone's been to our restaurants, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. I want to put that out there. Um, and if you have not, thank you so much for considering coming. Uh, 
And so Mustin Turner's is in Smyrna, and um, just, just north of 285 on Atlanta Road. We opened that in 2005, and that opened as a deli and gourmet retail shop. And uh, quickly, uh, in the, within the first year, we realized that business model wasn't working and transitioned to doing uh, dinner uh, at night. Retail was hard. Uh, we had no experience in it. And, uh, and it wasn't paying for the business model uh, that we had in place with, with cooking good food and, and having to hire highly skilled people to do it. And uh, so we start, created a little bar in the corner, uh, started doing dinner. That was going you know, great, enough to, to stay afloat. And, uh, and then we started uh, Local 3 in 2010. Chris Hall, who is our, our business partner, he's, a, he's also a partner in Muscle Turners, uh, came into the mix. And we opened up Local 3 in the former Joel space, um, which was a very prolific restaurant that was very well known for having the most ridiculous kitchen ever built in the history of man uh, for, a, for a restaurant. Um, and um, there's a lot of irony in that. Joel used to come to Muscle and Turner's a lot and talk to us about how much he didn't really like the big, big um, prestigious restaurant scene. And um, anyway, we ended up taking that over. Uh, which was confusing to folks. It was in the middle of the, it was really, it was 2010, so we're right in the thick of the recession, and everyone's trying to figure out how in the hell these guys from this little deli in Smyrna are taking over this temple to ego that was, it was a Michelin star chef, and uh, we kind of felt like the gypsies taking over the palace. It was pretty cool. Um, and, but we knew that neighborhood, and we knew the folks from that neighborhood were coming up to Muss and Turner's, and and lamenting on how they just really enjoyed being able to just come in their jeans or their tennis skirts and not, you know, feeling like they have to put their sport coat on to go to Blue Ridge or whatever. So they were coming up. We knew that folks were, were looking for a more casual option but still wanted a high-quality food experience. And, um, and that was very successful from the beginning. There wasn't much open. I mean, Empire State South had opened a few months before us, but there really wasn't a whole lot of restaurants opening at that time for obvious reasons. And um, soon after that, we decided that we were going to – uh, take the space next to Muss and Turner's and do something that we what we thought was be unique and different. And what drives our concepts more than anything is we try to we we build the things that we would want to go to ourselves. And so um, that became the genesis of Eleanor's. Um, and if you've been to Eleanor's, uh, you know that Eleanor Seal here is um, it is an homage to her. Uh, she was a second employee that we ever hired. Um, to say that she was integral in our success uh, would be the biggest understatement I could ever give. Um, this woman is um, you know, 81 years old. She's still working with us to this day. Um, it's, still, it's just amazing. So um, we decided that we wanted to create a speakeasy that was a unique and different ride in the amusement park that would also um, be synergistic with, with, with Muss and Turner's and bring that neighborhood something that's you know, unique, cool, hip, um, and uh, honor someone uh, appropriately, because most people don't get appropriately honored until they're no longer with us. And that was probably one of the top, top five experiences, if not greater, to sit across from this woman and, and let her know um, what we were going to do, what we were going to name it, and honor her uh, for all that she had done for us. So that was really fantastic. So. <laughs> Thank but most you. people don't know how to get to so, Eleanor's. Um, so, so there's a unique way to get in there. And I'm not going to, you've kind of already alluded to it. But um, uh, so we decided to create a unique entrance that, um, and it was, uh, this, Eleanor's is a very in, in, inclusive place. It's just, you got to know it's there. Uh, and if you figure out it's there, then you can come in. And uh, it's a, it's a, I'll give you the, 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 the answer to the test. It's a, uh, it's a freezer door. So it looks like you're going to a walk-in cooler or freezer. And, um, and it's a whole different world, so that's been fun. And it then, is a whole different world. <laughs> uh, and then after that, that was 2012, we opened a restaurant up in East Cobb called Common Quarter, uh, which we uh, ended up, we were up there for five years. I will call that our five-year walkabout, uh, and, uh, or our uh, $1.5 million PhD on how not to grow in business. Uh, in restaurants. Um, there's a lot of wonderful lessons that came from that, incredibly painful lessons. But um, uh, And then uh, we opened Warhorse Investments, which is a, a private dining club next to Local 3 in 2017, uh, July of 2017. And then uh, MTH Pizza, which is next to Muss and Turner's in the One Ivy Walk Center, which is um, 
a, a pizza shop that um, uh, that w we opened uh, October of 19, so right before the pandemic, um, which turned out pretty handy for the first two months when everyone was treating every night like Friday night, um, <laughs> which was great. And then um, Rochambeau, which we just opened back in November, and that's down on uh, Peachtree Battle Shopping Center. So you might as well describe that name. What does that mean? Rochambeau is a, is a term for the, uh, for the um, game Rock, Paper, Scissors. And so the play on that is we're, we're big on the number three, and it was a, um, there's three element, and tying in the menu uh, and the whole game into the, into the mix. And uh, the menu is a breakfast, lunch, and dinner options all day long. So we're calling it a modern American diner. There's nothing about it if you walk in there that, that screams this is a diner, except for the menu and the concept and the fun of taking you know, classic dishes and, and our twist on it that, that bring comfort and nostalgia to you know, some progressive culinary items that are you know, healthier and a little bit more pushing the envelope and just, just having fun. So if you can come in and you want to get you know, B for D, you can do that. If you want to get a bucket of fried chicken, you can do that. If you want a burger, um, there's a lot of different options, which uh, is, uh, seems to have struck a, a really positive chord, which is, and that neighborhood is just, if you live in the neighborhood and you've been coming, thank you. It's been an awesome reception so far, so appreciate it. So now that we know about your restaurants, let's move to the customer experience. Mm. Um, tell us how you um, have created the kind of customer experience and how do you maintain that through the different concepts of your restaurants? Yeah, so um, if you ask me or Todd or Chris what we're in the business of, uh, each of them would give you the same answer. We, on the surface, we are facilitators of food and drink. Um, but we really are brokers of human connection. Our segment, there's a lot of different segments within food service, which is nearly a trillion dollar industry in our company, in our, in our country. Um, but our, our segment is more uh, for experiential. Those are looking to escape, explore, celebrate, uh, do business deals, whatever that may be. And so for us, the common thread, you know, the, our, what we call our secret sauce has nothing to do with food. It has everything to do with connecting with humans at a meaningful level. And that's the common thread that goes amongst all of our restaurants. All of them are very different and unique, but no different than a, than a family. You have a, a common DNA thread or a common operating system. And, and each restaurant is like a, a different application or a different child that we plug into a back office, um, you know, behind the scenes, under the hood system that helps the businesses run as businesses should. Because if you guys understand restaurants, there's, you know, running a restaurant, an operation, is very different than running a business. And one of the reasons why our industry is so risky is you got people who understand how to run restaurants that have no clue about business. And then you got people who are very suc successful that think they want to get in the restaurant business or invest in it, and they have no clue on how to run a restaurant and the operations. So, um, so it's, that's been a big deal for us is to make sure that we have very sound and prudent business operations that support unique and different concepts that people interact with. And, um, but the staff and the way that we go about building culture and the hospitality element is, um, it's all tied together. So we, you know, the number one thing that we're trying to achieve in any of our concepts, uh, and if we start doing snow cones in Midtown next week, um, it is, it's, it, the, the one thing is, is building trust. That's it. I don't know of any long-term, genuine, meaningful relationship that, is, that exists without trust. It is an essential ingredient. And so we talk a lot with our staff about that's the goal. And you can't earn trust with a stranger. And so you have a server who's 23, and you come in into their life at their table, and we're asking them to try to build trust. And it's more about how to find ways to mitigate losing it quickly, um, but then finding ways to uh, build it. So, um, you know, the idea of making mistakes, which happens all the time in our business, um, is not a bad thing. It's actually a better opportunity to earn trust than if it was a flawless experience, because when mistakes happen, we can de demonstrate our intent and our motive is pure. We're, we're not here to try to get away with something. We're here to get you to want to come back and tell others. And, and, um, and trust is the primary thing. Our North Star um, I teach a, um, a hospitality 101 class to all of our staff members, and we talk about our North Star is we want everyone who comes in contact with our restaurants to think it's the best thing that happened to them all day. 
which sounds very idealistic and Pollyanna, but if you really think about the transactions we all go through on a day-to-day -day basis, it's not that hard to blow someone away. <laughs> it really isn't. And, um, and so that's the North Star. And we don't tell them exactly how to do it, but we just want them to figure out a way to do it. And it could be just a warm smile. It could be, I mean, a sample of a wine you weren't expecting to get. I mean, there's so many ways to do it. And our compass as a company uh, is we want everyone to, we, we hope that we earn the, the moniker of this is my favorite place. And when someone declares something their favorite, it's, it's much different than if, you know, Eater puts us on the essential 30, whatever, all that stuff. But when someone says it's my favorite, if you think about your favorite, your favorite football team, your favorite band, your favorite book, there's a sense of ownership that comes with that. And with ownership, when we can earn that from someone, they're, um, they're gonna be, there's gonna be loyalty, there's gonna be advocacy on our part, and there's gonna be protection. You know, and, and you go, well, yeah, they're gonna defend us online or whatever. That's not what I'm talking about. They'll, they'll protect us from ourselves. When someone wants us to win and they care about us as a team, they will let us know when we don't meet expectations. And that's gold for us is for someone, in, and a lot of people are very reluctant to come to me because they don't want to hurt our feelings or come across a certain way. But when we hear about things that are not meeting expectations and the, the, their intent is pure, it's gold. Because they're saying, I want you to win, and I'm telling you something that happened so that you can try to fix it. So I can keep coming back here and continue to have trust in what you guys are offering. And, um, and so, and then the last thing that we talk about, which I think is relevant everywhere, is this concept of relationship capital. And um, you know, there's a lot of different ways to measure wealth. I think uh, relationships is one of the key ones and, and what really matters in life. And there's this uh, exchange of energy exchange going on. For those of you guys who are accounting wonks, there's an there's a invisible ledger of debits and credits. And you know, throughout the day, we are either pouring energy into people or we are withdrawing. And it's just happening. And we all know the people in our lives who withdraw all the time. And, and so, but, but we're, as in the business of human connection, we have the privilege of, I mean, hundreds and thousands of people coming through our restaurants every day and giving a meaningful connection to them that pours really good positive energy into them. And the thing about relationship capital is you don't know what your balance is until the shit hits the fan. And it's That's amazing true. what happens. And we saw it in the Great Recession, and then we, we so saw it in the pandemic. It was unbelievable. I get, I get teared up even thinking about it. So we talk about that with our staff, like this is an opportunity, because you don't, you don't know who you're taking care of. You just don't know. And if you understand life, opportunities are not buttons on a wall. They come from people. And you have people coming in, you get a chance to connect with in a meaningful way. It's a really cool way to make a living. It's a really cool way to find opportunities. And it's a really amazing way to ensure that you're gonna be around for a while. So I can say, um, I took my mother to Local 3 for Mother's Day, right after we, the world woke back up after the pandemic. And she always talks about that place where that nice young man came over to talk to us. <laughs> So I can, I can say that. So let's move to uh, the pandemic. And uh, what, you know, from the restaurant perspective, what did you learn from COVID? How did you survive? How did your restaurant survive? And what, is, what are the things that you learned that you have carried forward that you maybe weren't doing before that? Yeah, so um, the pandemic for, for everyone uh, was, was a harrowing experience. It certainly was for us. Um, I've you know, had a philosophy of, of trying to find comfort in discomfort and uncertainty for quite some time. But when you're in a 30,000 foot free fall um, as a business owner and, and, and sending one email that, that lets go of 150 people at one time, um, it's, uh, it, was, it was a challenging experience. And I will say, you know, on the other side of it, now where I sit, I would not want to go through that again, but it was incredible experience for, for many reasons. Um, I don't think anyone should ever miss a really good dose of adversity. Uh, I think adversity is, is an amazing thing in our lives. It, it, it sucks while we're in it, um, but what it shows, it, 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 sh it shows us our weaknesses, it shows us our strengths, it shows us who really has our back or not, and that's gold if you're building an organization. Um, and so that was an extreme, extreme adversity for sure. But uh, we, a lot of people don't 
understand or, or, or see restaurants in this way, but we're in many ways logistics as experts. And because we have these little mini factories called kitchens and people come in and for us, um, we do everything we can to accommodate and customize everything that they are asking for. And so we have a menu, which seems to be almost like a suggestion. And then everyone's <laughs> like, you know, this would be ideal if we could do this, but we choose to accommodate. Um, and so when we, we closed down for a day on March 16th and, and sent that email, and then we, back, you know, we just had just salaried people. Um, I had my daughter, who was 14 at the time, in the, in the dish pit. And um, we opened back up just with online ordering, which we had never done before. But thankfully, we had just gone to a new POS system that had an online ordering um, platform. So the first day, we, we turned on the faucet, and the demand, the, it was unbelievable. Like, we it just, it, it was, uh, anyone seen the, the, the bear, the, the documentary? You know that, the second to last episode where the tickets just keep coming? And it was, it was, um, it was unbelievable because it was just like, oh my God, we are failing everyone because we it was taking an hour plus to get food because we just didn't realize how many tickets were going to come through. But at the same time, people were waiting, of course, on the other side of the table while everyone's wearing a mask. And, um, and I was just looking at them saying, sorry, but they were just so happy to be out. They were so happy to see that we were busy. And it was just, an, I'll never forget that experience for the rest of my life. And right after that shift, you know, we got together as a team and said, okay, that sucked. Um, how do we not let that happen again? And what are the levers we need to pull and the dials we need to turn? How do we toggle this in a way that we can handle? We now, this is amazing. We know we have volume coming that we weren't expecting. And all of a sudden we get to, you know, we got to work with that. And so soon after we were able to start bringing staff back because there were business levels that were enough to be able to um, and bring them back and pay them. and. Um, and so it was, it was, so the online ordering is something that we continue to do, um, and that stayed. Uh, this family meal concept of prepared meals, uh, that we have a various, you know, versions of that now. Uh, it's it's not emails. as popular, not as popular as it was because everyone's coming out, which is great. And um, re we were, um, thankfully, the, the local government allowed us to sell retail, wine retail. Um, which uh, historically you're not able to do, and that has stuck. And so we created a, a little um, wine club called Bird Dog Wine Club, and so we have a retail wine club, which is which has done really well, and that's stick around. Um, so, yeah, there's been a few things. But Muss and Turner's, we converted to one menu uh, and full service in the dining room, whereas always deli and counter service, and we're actually considering going back to the old model because it, we're seeing a little bit of a trend of, of uh, volume, uh, traffic a little lower during the day, and we're, we're getting um, pretty good. We're reading the tea leaves, and the, a lot of folks are looking for a little bit quicker lunch, business lunch, because business, business is coming back, and business lunches are coming back, so they're looking to get in, in and out a little bit quicker. So, But yeah, so we're going to go back to, I think, what it was. So let's pivot again, and uh, let's talk about your leadership philosophy. You've yeah. talked a little bit about it, so maybe if you want to combine that with your leadership philosophy and how you're building a culture within your different locations. Sure. Um, one of my leadership philosophies is to not use the word pivot after uh, uh, yeah. Sorry. COVID. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I don't know if there's a more overused word. But, um, but so um, that's, a two, that's loaded topics right there you just gave me. So culture and leadership. So I'll start with leadership. Um, so you know, the way I look at leadership, it is um, your, your, it's your ability to influence or work with or through others to achieve uh, an outcome or, or an objective. That's my simple way. If you Google leadership, there's two billion results. It's overwhelming. Um, and so there's various forms of leadership. For me, I subscribe to what I call authentic leadership, uh, which is uh, more a concept of, of instead of demanding respect, um, it's more of commanding respect and loyalty through, it's a contact sport, um, it's, it's earning someone's trust, it's um, being by their side where it, there's a lot of leadership roles where uh, people rely on title, rank, authority, fame, whatever it may be, but as soon as that's gone, no one's gonna be willing to follow them. And so the idea has been, let's, how do we create a scenario in which people are gonna be willing to run through a wall for you regardless of all of those things? 
um, which it's, it's, it's not easy. It takes a lot of time and a tremendous amount of emotional capital to do it. But that's been our, you know, the way that we've, we've gone about it, I've gone about it. And you know, within that, uh, I look at leadership in this way. So there's uh, leading, leading and managing yourself is one thing. Uh, and then if, if you can't effectively manage and lead yourself, you're gonna have a hard time authentically leading others. Um, and then if you're gonna go to the point of trying to lead leaders, and you still can't manage and lead yourself effectively, um, you're gonna have a hard time with this concept of authentic leadership. Um, you, can, you can do things through tyranny and demanding and all of these things, but I don't think it's sustainable long-term. And I can tell you from the younger generations, they're not buying into it at all. Because I told you so, yeah, they're not. <laughs> Work for me, but it, because I'm mama, yeah. nah, that doesn't work anymore. Yeah, exactly. So, um, and then within the realm of you know, so self management, I think is so key. And and in that realm, there's you know three areas that I focus on. I'll call it you know, personal agency framework. Um, and you know, personal agency is this concept of you you are in in, in control of your actions and the circumstances in your life, and um, you know having more uh, a higher level of self awareness I think is huge. Um, for me personally, I've spent the last 20, 25 years plus studying the thinking of others and reading books and watching TED Talks and all of these things, and not as much time as I should have been studying my own thinking. And uh, if, you, if you do some research on this, 95 to 97% of our thoughts um, on a daily basis, which are in the thousands, are subconscious or unconscious. It's fascinating if you really, really look into that. And if you, if you understand that our thoughts are directly tie into our emotions, which t directly tie into our behaviors, which directly tie into our results. You know, getting curious about those thoughts and the programming that we exist with, we've all been through a lot in our lives. And, and all of us probably endured some really well-intentioned people that messed us up a little bit and we don't realize it. And so we have these, you know, limiting beliefs and loops that are going on um, that are, you know, uh, we create narratives. We're, we're amazing at creating narratives. Uh, around things that are happening that we think are happening, but they're really not, or things like cognitive bias and understanding how much that's in play and our thinking and decision-making as leaders. It's a real thing. So understanding that, taking some time, whether it's you trying to unpack it yourself. I, I am a fan of, of hiring someone who's a professional that can help you unpack the luggage in a way that's not gonna be completely damaging. Um, the idea of trying to unpack your luggage um, that you're existing with now without someone's help, I think is, is, is almost futile. Um, the second element is energy. Um, you can have all the ambition and time and, in the world, but if you don't have energy, it's, uh, and this is, uh, you know, 10 years ago, I was, I was a sl I'll sleep when I'm dead guy. Um, let's go, we got things to do. Um, and now I realize how much, how critical it is. And, and, and energy is one of those things you, ca you, you can't, it's a quantitative property, like it is, you, you can't give it if you don't have it. And in the leadership role, if you don't have the energy, um, then it's hard to, in an authentic leadership role, to absorb all of the other, all the stuff and the people and everything coming at you. If you have nothing to give, it's very, very hard. And so, you know, things like sleep and hydration and exercise and all those things, and, and, and it's, I think, is critical. Um, and then the last element I would say is focus and your, your ability to focus on the right things at the right time is, is key. Everyone talks about time management and productivity, but it really comes down to focus and how good are you at asking yourself clarifying questions, um, you know, understanding what's in your control versus not. And you know, 95% of the stuff that we get impacted by mentally and emotionally is pretty much not in our control. And if you think about a no sane person would allow a, a situation or other person or circumstance that's not in their control to hijack their emotions, but it happens to us all the time. And it's a big deal in, in how we are able to focus on what really needs our attention. Um, one of the best books that I've ever read in this, in this realm is Essentialism by Greg McCown. Um, and this idea of, of um, is the, the subtitle is The Disciplined Pursuit of Less But Better. And his premise is, uh, people become successful and they climb up the proverbial ladder and they got more people and more things coming at them, which are oftentimes disguised as opportunities, but they're really distractions. 
from what got you there in the first place. So a lot of people who get kind of up there end up self-sabotaging or derailing themselves because they lose the discipline that got them there in the first place. Because more and more people want their time, their attention, opportunities come your way. Um, so that's, that's a, that ability to focus, having a cognition methodology of how you handle. I, I view it as air traffic control. Um, I want to be able to handle all the planes at Hartsfield-Jackson, not uh, a country airport that has three planes a week. And, and understanding that you know, this plane on the runway now needs my attention versus the 747 that just talk, took off from Tokyo. That's important because I don't want anyone to die. But I need to know that's, that's important, but I don't need to tend to that until two weeks from now or whatever it might be. And I think that's, that's huge. A lot of us, if you guys are all you know, organized, to-do list people, um, it's very easy to get just completely overwhelmed and drown in all the stuff that you feel needs your attention. If you can't clarify what needs it the most now, what will move the most, um, the ball down the field the most, and that's, that's big, that's big. So culture is the next one. Yeah, tell us, and how do you make all of that come to life in your restaurants? How do you build that culture? So um, one of the best, de culture is another thing like leadership. There's a lot of def definitions and, and a lot of opinions on it. Um, one of the best definitions that I subscribe to is um, culture comes down to um, the, the behaviors in the organization you're not willing to tolerate and actually executing on that. Uh, a lot of people talk about values and ways of behavior, but ultimately um, those who do go wayward or cross the line, don't, they're not held accountable. And so it's, uh, you know, in leadership, I think it's you, what you do speak so loudly, they can't hear what you're saying. And so our actions and how we deal with those who are not necessarily behaving in the manner that we, we think is um, the right way for us uh, is a big deal. And so we, we do a, an orientation with all new staff, me and my partners, and we go through our values. Um, and we talk to them uh, at length about why they matter to us. Because you can call them company values, but they're really, they're, they come from people. Companies are made of people, and there's, these, are the, these are the 10 things that we got three very different dues, but these are the 10 non-negotiables for us as an organization that if you cross the line, we're gonna have issues and if, you don't, if they don't resonate with you, that's fine. But you're just not gonna be a good fit for the family. And we do our best to get that out front and quick. Um, and then you have to have those values live because uh, a lot of people have values that are just collecting dust and no one, they don't live. They know there's, there's not this accountability of people modeling them um, and then the manager is managing to them. So typically if someone is in a sit down for a disciplinary reason, the managers are talking to them in the realm of our values, not necessarily the technical thing that, that they violated. So if they didn't do their side work, um, it's, it's not a matter of, of the side work itself, it's a personal responsibility is a value of ours and contribution is a value of ours. So we talk about it in those ways. So, um, and the, the other thing is, is, I'll call it, and going to back to the customer service is internal hospitality and our, our approach to hospitality is really simple, um, but like golf, it's a simple concept, but not easy to execute. Uh, and, and so, because That's you're dealing with humans and brains and everything else. And, uh, but if the people within our four walls feel a certain way, then we believe that, that will, um, our guests will, that will ripple into the guest experience. So if the people in our company feel appreciated and comfortable and secure and recognized and all of those things that we want you all as our guests to feel, um, if they genuinely feel that way, then, then that's gonna ripple naturally into the guest experience. And so a big part of our culture is, is how, we, um, how we treat each other. And it's a 360 proposition. It's not a top down, bottom up, it's side to side. It's, um, it's, it's, it's everywhere. So. Well, it's pretty obvious that that's how you feel about um, your employees. Um, so much so that you and, and some others uh, created the Giving Kitchen. Yeah. So tell us about the Giving Kitchen and um, congrats to you for uh, them being selected as part of the Bulldog 100 this year. Yeah. It's very yeah. exciting. So, uh, um, yeah. But the concept is greater than, yeah, than that. Yeah, sure. Well, Brian Schroeder, who's our executive director, is I, I believe he was the, recognized in the Bulldog 100, which was... 
uh, a big deal for him is a big deal for us as an organization. And he he could not he was hoping he could be here today, but he, he can't. Um, but um, so the Giving Kitchen, this is um, this is one of those topics that I could go on for hours. I'll I'll do my best to keep this succinct. So uh, in 2012. And uh, our, one of our chefs, uh, Ryan Heidinger, who had been with us for seven years at Muss and Turner's, uh, was diagnosed with stage four gallbladder cancer uh, at age 35. So he was told by a, a doctor he had never met that he had a 5% chance to live in six months. And, um, and he and his uh, wonderful wife, Jenny, who's here, um, uh, we sat in front of them and soon thereafter the diagnosis and asked their permission to raise money and try to help them. Ryan was, you know, we kept him on salary. He had health benefits, but with that diagnosis, we knew he was going to need a war chest. And so that, um, thankfully, Jenny and Ryan were willing to trust us. Um, and uh, we, we started a, a, an event called Team Heidi, which happened about four weeks after and ended up being about 800 people. And we raised $275,000. And Ryan uh, stood in front of that group uh, of 800 and declared that he had already won and um, that, the, the, that cancer was a gift. And all of that had happened around them. Um, you know, he and Jenny's desire and willingness to be courageous and accept a, a, a just a, an incredible situation. Um, and, and soon thereafter, after the first event, we should call Team Heidi, um, I, I, I guess, uh, proposed an idea to Ryan and Jen that, that they pursue their dream restaurant, which is called Staple House, and not only pursue it, but turn it into an organization that was going to give back to the community that had lifted them up in their time of need. Uh, in my mind, I was modeling East Lake Golf Club, uh, where I worked, uh, and what Tom Cousins did there um, is remarkable. And I was, my naivete is really a good thing. And I was like, why can't we do this with a restaurant? And um, that turned into what has become now the Giving Kitchen, which um, over the last uh, 10 years uh, has helped uh, almost 12,000 people in the food service industry uh, and over $8 million in direct financial um, grants or awards. And so folks who are in our industry who um, are out of work due to illness, injury, disease, uh, fire in their home or a deceased loved one. Um, we're there to help them from being employed uh, in that gap to getting back to work. And a lot of folks, I, I'm sure you're, you're aware that uh, a lot of folks in our industry are one paycheck or one shift away from a negative financial spiral um, that can, if they don't have a good network of folks, can put them in an incredibly precarious position. Honestly, in many ways, we're a safety net from people becoming homeless. Uh, and um, and so we started off in Metro Atlanta, grew into Georgia. Um, we are actually now, we're considering ourselves a national organization. So if a request comes in from anywhere in the country, we're accepting it. Uh, we're just activating different markets all over the country. So we've activated Nashville. Um, we just activated Charlotte uh, last week. And we're, we're doing our best to grow in a, in a prudent manner so that we can handle it. Um, but you know, this, it doesn't happen. Um, all these people that have been impacted and will be impacted without Jen and Ryan being as courageous as you both were and deciding to plant the seed of tragedy and turning it into something just, just remarkable. Um, our industry is, we, we're almost 15 million people that work in the food service industry. And it's only second to the US government. It's a lot of people. And it's not the most stable industry. And as you guys experienced in the pandemic early on, you like us and you need us a little bit more than you realized. And, um, and the federal government deemed us essential and allowed us to go back to work. And, um, and I don't see, as we have, we have been for decades, just becoming more and more of a service consumer-based economy. And people are more and more in tune or, or uh, likely to go to, to get food to take out or to eat in or just not cooking as much. And so um, I think it's the organization as a safety net uh, is amazing. And then you have the stability network, which we, par we partner with 
uh, other community resources that are established right now, and if folks don't need immediate financial assistance, we can plug them into different organizations that can help them that are established already, and modeling that throughout the country um, is, um, is something that's really exciting, and uh, it's, it's so far beyond what we ever fathomed. It's, it's awesome. So I'm gonna ask one more question, and then I'm gonna let this wonderful crowd ask sure. you some questions. Um, all of that that you're doing, how do you balance all of that and still have time for Shelly and the kids and everything that goes into that? You know, we talk about work-life balance, it's really not. But how do you do that? Obviously, she's, you know, she's here, she still loves you after everything you do. <laughs> uh, it's, so the, I'll go back to the self-management piece that I talked about earlier. Um, it, it comes down to my ability to, to manage myself um, have clarity on my commitments. I think um, uh, the more clarity you can have on what you're willing to say yes to, the easier it is to say no to other things. Um, and committing and blocking. So to me, you know, we all we measure time through clocks, and um, and calendars to me is, uh, you know, the context of our life is basically tied to our commitment. If you think about it, it's commitments to work, commitments to family, commitments to church, whatever it may be, commitments to playing golf. And the calendar is a reflection of our commitments. And so if you looked at my calendar, you're going to see more appointments with myself than there are with others. And the reason is I block time to focus on the things or the people that I declare that I'm committed to. And having a commitment audit for yourself is a really good idea. I did that a few years ago and it's incredibly enlightening because I want to be someone, I'm a pleaser. I want to, I want to, I want to help everyone. I have trouble saying no. And all of a sudden I'm looking at trying to juggle all these balls and I can't do it. And so, um, having clarity in what you want to be committed to, whether it be your health, um, blocking time. So someone comes to me and says, I'm committed to this, or I'm going to start my own business or, or whatever it may be. And I say, let me see your calendar. If they don't have time blocked, to focus on that is I'll tell them you that's a hope and a dream and you might get there but if you don't take this precious commodity of time which is you know refilling and replenishing but depleting on a constant basis I mean we all have the same amount of time in a week 168 hours so whether you have a job a business or you're Richard Branson and you have 78 businesses I mean how does he's got the same time I mean how does how is and he seems pretty damn happy. I don't know. I don't know him if he really is or not. But um, so um, committing to family. And so, you know, early on when I was in the restaurants all of the time, I would have Thursday nights blocked for, for family. And, you know, Musk would used to, he, he was not a calendar guy. And, you know, he'd say, why do you have your family on there? You're going to forget about them or something? I said, no. If I don't put it on there, inevitably someone's going to ask for my time. And I'm going to say yes. And now I'm disregarding the thing that I said I was committed to and, and disappointing them and trying to please someone else because I didn't have that in there blocking it and at least allowing me to be conscious about that decision and being able to communicate effectively. Honey, I won't be home until whenever. Um, and so the kids, we're at a point now where we have, uh, we have over 30 Almost, how many managers do we have? Almost 35 managers in the organization. And so at this point, I'm not um, as tethered to the operations as, as I once was. So I have a lot more autonomy than I did. So now, you know, everyone wants to be autonomous and free, um, but not everyone can handle it because uh, you don't have the discipline because all of a sudden, if you don't necessarily have a boss, but you want to try to uh, maintain relevance and contribute and bring value in a positive way, now you got to figure out ways to do it. Um, and that's, that's my challenge now is trying to, you know, bring rain and sunshine to the garden while others are tending to it. Well, it sounds like you're doing pretty good. She's still hanging around, so, yeah. <laughs> okay, um, we'll open it up to the crowd. Um, if you would, wait for a mic to come around. Um, uh, oh, oh. All right. Start with Mary here. Yeah. So I might have missed this, but how are you continuing to raise funds for the Giving Kitchen? Great question. Uh, so 
there are a lot of different revenue sources coming in. Uh, for the, we thought it was going to be this restaurant that would generate this revenue, and, and it's t the restaurant, Staple House, didn't even open for two years after we started the Giving Kitchen. And, um, but there's uh, ways, there's all kinds of ways. There's, uh, you know, uh, beers that are brewed or whiskeys, um, or um, our, my buddy here, Jim Chasteen, American ASW. I mean, they've been huge supporters in many ways. Uh, you have uh, individuals, uh, you have restaurants hosting events, you have um, our supply chain. Uh, you know, the, so food service alone on the surface is a trillion, almost a trillion, and then you have the supply chain behind it. So the economics of this industry is massive. And um, supply chains stepped up in big ways. One of the wonderful, most wonderful things for the, from the pandemic for the Giving Kitchen was um, proof of concept was there and, and all of these larger foundations that we had been um, getting in front of and sharing our story, but they're like, this is a great idea and this is cute and all, but you need some time and we need to be able to trust that you're gonna be able to execute on what you say you're gonna execute on. Um, I didn't realize that foundations were kind of like venture capitalists, like but their ROI is very different, but impact is a big deal and they, it, the scrutiny level is amazing. Um, and so, you know, United Way came up with a quarter million during the pandemic, you know, uh, Matt Ryan and Freddie, Freddie Freeman, 50 grand each. And so all of a sudden, we had over 5,000 people donate to the Giving Kitchen between um, the, the start of the pandemic and the end of May that had never donated before. So, um, and, and it continues. And so we have um, Yum Brands, uh, KFC, their foundation. Uh, we just had a dinner with them. They, they just committed 2.5 million just for capacity building so that we could actually do what we say we're gonna do and, and grow across the country. Um, and uh, so it, there's a lot of different revenue sources that are coming in, it's pretty, and, and my favorite is, is our, the people who work in our industry giving a couple, couple bucks per paycheck and, um, and, and um, contributing to a cause that's benefiting them. It's a, it's a really neat thing. Over here. Uh, yes, thank you so much. Uh, this is my first time here and this was a unexpected joy. So okay. thank you very much. And then, um, do you guys set aside time for uh, to update your headshots every once in a while? Just, <laughs> just, just a question. Um, um, <laughs> that's not my question. That was uh, last week. This is, <laughs> this is my I've question. I've been waiting to get called out on this. <laughs> Thank the, you for that. Sure. Um, my question has to do with the 15 million workers in the restaurant industry uh, nationwide. Um, can you address the issue of minimum wage and how you guys are addressing that, yeah. the economic, social, cultural kind of sure, sure. connection? Sure, yeah, it's a loaded question. Um, you were my friend until you asked that. No, I've got it. So for us, I'll speak for, for us. And we, um, uh, it was 2021 in June, we made a decision internally to, um, to raise our internal minimum wage to $16. And it wasn't a political decision, it was, it was for us the right thing to do, um, and we felt that the climate was, it was the right time in the climate because everyone as a consumer was coming back from the pandemic, they understood a little bit more about what we brought to their lives, um, and you know, we've always wanted to pay more. I, I would, I'd be hard pressed to find someone in our industry that doesn't want to pay their people more. It comes down to, are you all willing to pay more for the burger and the fries and everything else? And so for us, we felt like because everyone understood staffing issues was front and center, supply chain issues were front and center, and then you had people that are just pent up and it's so excited to come out, we felt it was the right time to say, okay, we're gonna raise our prices a little bit um, but we're gonna pay our people more. No one's gonna make less than that. Now, a lot of our servers, a lot of, there's a lot of confusion on this because we, we uh, it's 2.13 an hour for, for a server or bartender, and everyone focuses on that. And yeah, that's well below minimum wage, but our servers are making minimum $20 an hour up to over 50. Uh, so they're, they're, we're, they're not in that category of people that are suffering, so to speak, um, with, with wages. And so for us, we, we made our, our, our decision, um, you know, management-wise, we, we do everything we can to pay top of market. We do everything we can to have all the benefits and everything else that comes with it because we want to attract a certain type of person. And, and in, the, in the realm of competition, 
which it is fierce in our industry, and, and I'll say it's more fierce for staff than it is for guests, um, it's, it's a big deal. Now, in the, in the realm of, of, of quick service restaurants, QSR, I, it's not my world, um, but, but to me, that's, it's, a, it's an amazing opportunity. I, I had a chance to, to share my thoughts with someone who's pretty high up with Chick-fil-A recently, and I, I think a company like that has the, the brand capital to say, hey, we're gonna pay our people more and we're gonna charge you a little bit more and that line that's three times around their building may go to two and a half if they, if they charge a little bit more, but I think most people would understand because of the brand capital that they've, they've established. And, um, but um, that, but the, the simple economics of this is if the consumer is willing to pay more than then we're, our ability as restaurateurs to, to pay them more, it, it happens, you know? So like it, you go to Home Depot, it's all baked in to the hammer. Like people get benefits and compensation, et cetera, but it's all baked into, you know, into the, into the products. And so for us, it was the first time we felt, I felt very comfortable saying to anyone, we are charging you more. Um, and you should demand a higher uh, a level of experience. I mean, we're trying to do something that's high quality. Um, we're doing everything we can to make you feel like gold while you're experiencing the transaction. Um, and we're gonna charge you a premium for it because we want to, we have to pay a premium for the products we're sourcing. We have to pay a premium for really skilled people who love to cook and doing it a certain way and taking the time and the talents and the knowledge to do it in a way that you can't. And even if you could, you don't have the time to do it at home. And, um, and that's, you know, and it's most reasonable people go, that makes sense. And we gotta execute on it. So, um, so yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. It's, it's yeah. insanely complicated. <laughs> yeah. Other questions? Right. Hey, Ryan. Um, just with uh, you know, fast casuals and QSRs, they're all struggling with some of the same things around delivery and third party, whatnot. Just given your focus on connectivity and the customer experience, how how do you how do you reconcile that with the advent of ghost kitchens and you know all these disintermediate services yeah. are really only about the food? That's a great question. So uh, from my perspective, there's a, a, a significant bifurcation going on in our industry. And so when at one end, you have the transactional realm of, of eating out, which is very much, I'm hungry, I want food that I think is okay, and I want it as conveniently and as quickly as possible. And so whether it be out of a ghost kitchen or a third party delivery or going through you know, Chipotle, whatever it may be, um, the f those folks are not looking for an experience, so to speak. They're looking to fill their bellies and move on. They want energy, and, and, and more and more people are, are becoming very in tune with the things that they consume and the, how it impacts them and their health, current and, and long term. And so that industry and what's going on there is, is fascinating to watch. And that's not going away. If you, if you study our industry, and go back even to the 1950s, and you got you know McDonald's, and then all of a sudden, you go to any small town in America, there's going to be five or six restaurants. I mean, so this idea of bringing food conveniently to people, that's been around for a while. This is just the next generation of it, and you got a generation of people that are younger that are they're willing to pay more. It's it's mind blowing to me how much more they're willing to pay to have something brought to their bed or their office or, or whatever. I mean, we, we do DoorDash um, with, uh, and Uber Eats with, with MTH, our pizza place, and we charge 20% more. Um, so we're becoming more and more open to it. Um, you know, we're playing with the idea of, of doing it at Must and Turners. The other thing about third-party delivery is you gotta be careful that you don't overwhelm your, your, your existing logistics. And so if you got a full dining room at you know, noon or seven o'clock at night, and all of a sudden you have tickets flying in of trying to feed people outside of your four walls, you're gonna, you're gonna really hurt yourself by, by the experience that those in your dining room are gonna have. And you gotta be really careful of that. Anybody else? Oh. I mean, we're gonna start. Yeah, I can hear you though. Yeah. <laughs> typical mm -hmm. and where we've gone from an economy, right? Mm -hmm. When the pandemic hit, 
Everybody was so ready to thank everybody with more of that. Now I can't think if my tires change without getting head up for an additional 20%, right? Yeah. You're after finite dollars, and those dollars are getting squeezed more and more and more out of everybody's wallet. How does that impact your business, right? When you're competing against QSRs and even other folks, yeah. when now everybody's demanding that tip, and you're building a culture where folks are coming to work you know, with you, where well, that's you know par part of the comp. Yeah, it is. You know, uh, if you are, anyone's familiar with um, Union Square Hospitality Group or Danny Meyer up in New York, he um, he five maybe six years ago had a uh, went with a hospitality included business model where. Basically, the tip was baked in to the, uh, the price of everything, and it was a distribution of tips going to everyone on staff and to try to elevate the back of the house wages. And unfortunately, that model, um, as much as, I mean, from the beginning, I was looking at it really closely because it was something that was, for us, something that was really interesting and inspiring. Uh, unfortunately, it's, it's, he's, he's not doing it anymore. Um, and so this tip culture, this idea of, of you know, the, the acronym TIPS comes from to ensure proper service. The irony of it coming on the end of the experience is a little interesting if you think about that, right? But, um, and so those who have their handout that maybe didn't hurt the pandemic, I really don't have much to say about that other than I hear you because I'm experiencing it myself. And, um, and so for us, when you're talking about discre you know, discretionary dollars um, and also discretionary time. Uh, so one of our experiences, that lessons in, in East Cobb was you have, you have a lot of people that live up there and on paper it looks amazing. But if you really, really uh, look at the discretionary dollars and more so the discretionary time because everyone has kids and they're busy and they just don't go out and there's all this stuff, um, you have to have your, your focus on that. So for us, it's how do we build the better campfire? How do we, not just for, for guests, but for staff. And if we can build a, a campfire that people wanna come to, then uh, they're gonna be taken care of. And uh, people are happy to do it. And um, you know, uh, you know Char Charles over here is a, is a member of our club and, and been a regular at Local 3 for years. And, and you know, he can attest that, you know, he wouldn't be doing that if, if he was treated like a jerk and people weren't as friendly and, and accommodating and warm and nice and everything else. And so to us, um, you know, co our view on competition has always been, uh, we, we pay attention because we're interested in ideas that will inspire us, but we're very focused on our own four walls. There is ample content on a given, any given day on things that we can improve upon to be better at what we do. And so spending our time you know, we're trying to build a taller building, not, not worry about everyone else's in here. So I don't know if that answers your question, but. So I think we have time for just one more. Anybody, okay, right here. Uh, you talked about, I can just speak out. Yeah. Uh, you talked about, you know, the East Cobb location. Um, and then, so I guess two questions. One is, I guess, what's your creative process for coming up with a new location? And then how many concepts have been abandoned before they ever came up? None, none. Um, so, and that comes down to our, our, our selection and our, our, our process of, uh, one of the, another lesson from East Cobb was really getting clear on our criteria for growth. Again, getting very clear on what you're willing to say yes to makes it easier to say no. Because we get offers all of the time from developers now, um, and, and they're, you know, they've thrown a lot of money our way and it's very intoxicating to be pursued, intoxicating to go, wow, we open there, and man, that could be big numbers, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, we, we um, pulled out of a deal uh, at the last minute with, at, on the Beltline, which was a, it was a massive mega deal for us, but ultimately, um, it comes down to our geography, and the way we define it is from, you know, if you kind of take the top of Midtown and this triangle that kind of goes up 75 into Buckhead up into Smyrna. I mean, that's our community. That's where our brand capital is strongest. Uh, and, and, and so for us, uh, finding locations within that, you know, I'll give it to you from a very, really very real perspective. If, I, if it's gonna take me longer than 25 minutes to drive to without traffic, I don't want anything to do with it. Um, and maybe I'm one more layer removed from 
the organization at some point. I might be open to it, but right now, um, if I'm the one that's going to get called to put out the fire, I'm not necessarily interested in going to Decatur or Alpharetta or any, any of these places that are booming and amazing. Um, so uh, to me, there's, there's four ingredients in, um, in the whole game of restaurant. You need, you need a concept, you need people, you need a location, and you need money. And so for us, we've, um, you, know, you have concepts like a Chipotle that is it's site selection. Where can we find, or Starbucks, it's where can we find the best piece of property in which we know enough people that know us will stop in. And, it, and so it's, a con, it's, a, it's more of a location driven. They have the money, uh, they have the concept, now they'll just plug in the people. And so for us, it's been people first, who do we have that we can grow with, that we know and we trust, that will create opportunity for them, and can we do it in a way, if we pull them out, are we, are we, do we have a house of cards? Because if, if they are the linchpin of an organization, then our organization's weak. There has to be redundancy. So, so the people's key in driving it, um, coming up with concepts, you know, a bottle of bourbon, it doesn't take long uh, for us to come up with one. And you know, it's, there's, there concepts are dime a dozen, so to speak. But um, once we find a location, we think, feel like we have the people, then we, we do our best to figure out, okay, what would be a place that we'd want to come to that we think would resonate with this particular neighborhood? What do we feel is a dearth? Um, you know, and so this, this triangle I'm talking about, saying, okay, what, what's another concept that we could do? Um, you know, we're not thinking, let's do another Muss and Turners per se, but okay, Muss has really great experience with authentic Mexican cuisine. Um, you know, he used to be the chef for Sala for Fifth Group, and we really like Mexican food. And you know, people ask us where we go to eat all the time, and we are going to the places you guys don't know about or don't dare to go to. Uh, you know, off Buford Highway or, or wherever in Smyrna, we're going to get the authentic food, which we love, and, um, but bringing uh, that authenticity in a, in a more convenient, comfortable manner for folks is something that is what drives us in figuring out what we're gonna do next, so. Thank you so much for being here. It has been a pleasure, as always. <laughs> So, Ryan, we have a nice red and black sculpture for you. Awesome. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Go dogs, by the way. Go dogs.